Jesus is the bridge of peace that we need. He is the bridge of peace. I wrote this message because of an interaction that I had with a relative because of the way it impacted me. You see, we're experiencing some increased anxiety right now. With the coming of Independence Day, it's important for us Americans to lay aside division and to come together. I remember 9-11 well. I remember where I was. I remember what I was doing. I remember who I was with. I remember some of the smells, the sights, the sounds. I remember it. I also remember coming together as a nation like we hadn't done. And we prayed for our nation. We repented before the Lord. We rebuilt and, and, and had rest we restored what the terrorists had tried to take from us. We became aware of our surroundings, but for the most part, things pretty much went on as usual. We had a little hiccup as we waited, but, but things went on. But what we've seen in the last few years is very different. We've experienced struggles like we haven't any other time in history. Anxiety, isolation, and discord have impacted our families, our communities, our politics, our state, our country, our world. But especially our interactions with one another. They've been impacted by everything going on. You see, we're being separated and called out because of our beliefs or our ideologies. And it's happening all over. This is not a political statement. It's not one side versus the other. It's not one nation versus the other. It's happening everywhere. Where if someone doesn't believe like we believe, we cancel them out. We just say, oh, skip you. I don't have time for you. The decision of the Supreme Court to put the abortion issue back to the states is the latest thing in, in this created firestorm. We have an enemy that is coming against you and he wants to separate out so that he can destroy those who are weak. You see, it's how we handle as Christians these interactions, these difficult conversations, or even verbal attacks that will determine what or how an entity will continue on. Whether that entity is a church, whether it's uh, a family, whether it's um, a, a country, a nation, a state. You know, how we handle that as Christians really shows a lot about our faith with Christ, about our trust. You learned a lot about God <laughs> through those trials. You learned a lot. And even though you maybe knew a lot about God, you learned even more. Because he's always revealing deeper and deeper things. Taking off the onion peel skin, so to speak. You know, just because we are Christians doesn't mean that we're immune from conflict within the church even. I have friends who are on the complete opposite end of the spectrum than me on many major issues. Especially on this... Um, pro-choice abortion, whatever you want to call it. Especially on this, I have a friend who has eight children, and yet she thinks completely different than I do about this issue. Mm -hmm. Now, can we remain friends? Can we have a conversation and talk about things? Yes, we absolutely can. You know, when the Pharisees saw Jesus casting out demons, they attributed this to the worker workings of the ruler of the demons. It seems that when people don't understand something, it's too easy for them to either dismiss it or to attribute it to the enemy. Just because they don't understand. They go on the offensive and they attack. This is happening. It has happened. Jesus quickly reminded these Pharisees in Matthew 12, 25. Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And I apologize. I have failed. <laughs> Again. I forgot to give the scriptures ahead of time to Dan, so I apologize, Dan. Thank you for keeping up with me. Matthew 12, 25. Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself shall not stand. You see, division causes confusion, and confusion breeds anxiety. Anxiety robs peace, and peace 
Displaced breeds contentious thoughts and actions. It's these thoughts and actions that determine a future course of an entity. Jesus came to set us free from this. All of this. Confusion, discord, anxiety. He wants to set us free from everything that keeps us away from him. He is the Prince of Peace, and the fruit of His Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and <laughs> self-control. The one we lack so often in self-control. He is the bridge of peace. But as I said before, there is a psychological warfare going on in the church and her leaders. Unrest through doubts and futile thinking and relational conflicts is a tool of warfare. We so often do not recognize that. It's a tool of warfare. My cousin was in the army during both Iraq wars. He happened to serve in the psychological warfare division. He explained to me how that works where, you know, before you ever send troops in, you send in leaflets, you use radio and TV because you want the the citizens of the country you're going into to be on your side. You want them to understand that what's going on in that country is not what it should be. So always there is this uh, psychological warfare that occurs first. If you can defeat the morale from the inside, the land assault is almost uneventful. That first time we went into Iraq, my cousin said he was right in that first convoy. He said the soldiers would come up, they'd just lay their arms down. They would run, they would ask for food, water, whatever. So turn with me to Philippians 4. And again, just keep in mind, this message came as a, as a response to a very difficult conversation I had had with a relative. Philippians 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyk to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who shared in my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement, also and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. In this letter, Paul exhorts them to stand firm in the Lord. You see, he's already spent this whole book talking about who is Christ, the supremacy of Christ, how to be like Christ, what to do. And he says, the one thing I do is I press on. I forget what lies behind, I press on. So Paul is saying, I want you to stand firm in everything I've already told you up to this point, because that is a truth. You can put your, um, you can you can place your bet on that, so to speak. Not that we bet, um, but he's saying you can count on that. You stand firm in that. He's saying, follow my example. Jesus is Lord. Follow my example. Keep first things first. And remember the goal, so stay focused. You see, Paul loved this church. It was his first church on European soil. You remember what happened. He was um, on his way to Ephesus with um, Silas, and he got this vision from the Lord. You know, every time he tried to get into Ephesus, he'd find a roadblock. And so he got this vision from the Lord that was a man calling from Macedonia saying, come and help me. Come and help us. You know, Paul loved this church. It was his first church there on European soil. He was invested in this church. He had spent time with them. They were vested in him. They would send him financial support, even though they really didn't have extra. Philippi was situated on a major trade route from Asia into Europe. They had experienced a lot, they had seen a lot, um, they had rulers come and go, uh, people had differing views, and every time a ruler would come in, they would bring in their own religion with its icons or ideologies or idols, and so they had seen a lot. Philippi was a small place. You know, even though it was one of the major cities, there were only about 10,000 residents, which was small for that time. So turn with me to Acts 16. 
You know, women played a prominent role in the founding churches in Macedonia, especially in Philippi. Lydia was the first convert, and we can read that in Acts 16. I'm going to go down to verses 11 to 14. So putting out to sea from Troas, so they had this vision of the man from Macedonia saying, Come help us, come help us. So they put out to sea from Troas. They ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we were staying in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside, where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. We sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And I would say in regards to our family and our, our community and our nation, we need to continue to pray that the Lord would open their heart. Because unless the Lord opens the heart, unless he draws them in, um, how can they respond? How can they know? We go, we speak, but it is the Lord who draws them in, who opens their heart. Amen. So it was also just following this, what I read, where the slave girl had been delivered from uh, a demonic spirit of divination, and her handlers were not very happy, and so they tried to um, throw Paul and Silas into prison. So Paul calls out these two women back at Philippi, or back in the Philippians. He calls out these two women, Yodia and Sinta, to live in harmony with the Lord. Here they were leaders in the church. Paul says, they, they stood with me. They helped me in promoting the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, they fought side by side with me. So here's the picture he gives. Here are these two women next to Paul, side by side. They're like these gladiators. They have full armor on. They have these huge swords. They have these big shields. They have this full helmet. They're ready to go. They are afraid of nothing. They are strong. They are intense. And they are focused. Doesn't sound like anyone you know, right? They're committed to the Lord. But something had come between them. At some point, they were not of the same mind. So, you, just so you don't think that this is just a woman problem, you know, because sometimes we women get a bad rap of things. So just so you don't think it's a woman problem, turn with me to Acts 15. You see, before Paul and Silas ever went into Macedonia or into Philippi, there was an altercation. He and Barnabas were going to go on this journey to revisit the churches that they had planted or, or been in along the way. And so Paul, Paul was not in agreement with Barnabas' desire to take John Paul Mark because he had left them. He says in verse 36, After some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brethren in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John called Mark, but Paul kept insisting that, that we should not take him along who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there occurred such a sharp disagreement. That kind of, the words don't say it all. Such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another. You know, I grew up with four brothers. When there's a sharp disagreement, it's usually a slug out. You know, it's usually a, you know, I'm having my way. And, but then they're fine afterwards. But this was a sharp disagreement. So Paul chose Silas and left, being committed to the brethren by the grace of the Lord. Okay? So it's not just a woman problem. It's a human nature problem when we have disagreements because uh, we're so focused or we're so intense on things. Or sometimes we just might want things our own way. Right? So... The difference of opinion between Paul and Barnabas actually led to two separate trips going out. There was actually multiplication. 
So it, was it wasn't used to divide. It actually was used for going out by God. And we know later on that they came together again. So Paul calls out the conflict of these two women for the sake of the gospel. You know, if someone comes to you and says, hey, you probably should, you know, talk to so-and-so. Really, we need to listen with our heart and, and see what the Lord would have us do. He didn't want their testimony to suffer. You see, Paul understood, but he didn't want their testimony to suffer. I remember a time when a close friend had asked me if I would help her write a Bible study. Two other women and myself and then this friend, which we did. Um, and we taught it several times. It was a, maybe a nine-week or 12-week course. I can't remember right now. We taught it several times to our women's group and very good results, very good fruit, changed lives. And then um, we revamped it just a little uh, and used it to teach married couples the same principles. Um, we called it Off-Road Adventures for the Married Couples. And, and uh, again, very good fruit. But then the Lord began to call me to a different place with a different friend. And the first friend, the one I wrote the study with, was very upset with me, very hurt. Maybe she felt replaced. I don't know exactly. And um, so even though we would have these interactions, we still went to the same church, things were pretty tricky between us. Um, and at one point, she, we were in a small group, and, and there was a, a bit of an explosion. Because, you know, when we have problems and stuff them down, they're bound to come out eventually. So there was a bit of an explosion, which really hurt my heart for her. And uh, I just, I was determined, as was she. We were both determined to reconcile, to work this out, to have restoration. You know, because we didn't want it impacting us. Um, it was hard work, but it was worth the effort. So she's since moved to a different state, but we do still keep in touch. You see, when we work closely together with others, tensions can arise. So Paul says, live in harmony. He says, set your affections on Christ. Make it all about Christ Jesus, because he'll give you a heart for the other person. He'll give you a heart for the people if you set your affections on Christ. He says, be of one mind. It is all about Christ, isn't it? Yeah. So as we work together, we just keep our mind on Christ. We keep focus and consider others over yourself. Play your own part in the musical score. Because when each one does what they should do, a wonderful masterpiece is brought to life. So this is why we want to work with some of the other churches. Because we want to work together spreading the gospel. We can't let division happen. We can't let, um, we can't let that attitude of I'm better than everyone else happen. We need to be working together. We need to work out uh, for the sake of the gospel. So one of the tools to be able to refocus are joy and gentleness. The scripture says in chapter 4 of Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. You know, this is not a superficial, self-fueled, external, happy face. It's not a fake it till you make it smile. This is something that occurs so deep within, it can never be snatched away from you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Paul writes this letter. He's tucked away in prison, in this dark, dank prison cell. He's suffering himself, and yet he's able to exhort them to rejoice, this little church in Philippi. He's saying rejoice. Find the joy in whatever moment you are in. He's saying, yes, your situation might look a little dire, even trying at times. You suffer for the sake of the gospel. Prejudices against you abound. Nevertheless, nevertheless, no matter what we are going through, no matter how life is impacting us, we can always find joy in the moment. Always. Maybe the sun is shining. Maybe we actually have shoes that fit. 
Maybe we have a bed to sleep in. Maybe Jesus Christ is our Savior. What more is there to find to take joy in? You know, we're saved by grace through faith. It's not something we have to do. That's an amazing thing to take joy in. I don't have to work myself to the bone just to be possibly made right with God. Jesus already did it for me. That's a huge thing to take joy in. No matter what we're going through, be confident that if you are a lover of God, he's working all things together for your good to produce his best in you. So let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. You see, when God works in you, when he comes in you, <laughs> when he comes in you, when his spirit comes into you, this has a hole in the end, when his spirit comes into you, and you are in right relationship with him, you are taking joy, you are in right relationship with one another, what comes out is pure. The less junk you have in your life, the more pure it is. But tell me, does anyone want to touch this? You want to touch this? Why not? It's impure. It's impure. And yet, if my heart is impure, I'm putting those impurities on everyone I touch. You see, if I came over here and just did that, oh, see? You didn't want that, did you? Now I think I have to wipe the carpet. <laughs> you see, God puts in us purity. And he wants us to allow him to flow. Oh, look at that. See? If you don't notice it, you might even have it all over yourself. And it doesn't come off very well. Let your forbearing spirit be made known to all men. The Lord is near. That's verse 5. The most immediate expression of a rejoicing heart is a Christ-like gentleness toward all people. It does involve this patient bearing of slander or gossip or whatever, only because you're a believer. Let me explain. The Philippians were marginalized for believing in Christ. Have you ever had anyone discount your thoughts or your ideas because you are a Christian? Have you ever had anyone misinterpret you because you are a Christian? Has anyone ever expected way too much out of you because you are a Christian? Did they expect you to be perfect? Has anyone outright lied about you or spoken evil against you? You see, if a person truly prays that I may know Christ and the power of his resurrection, that I may share in the fellowship of his suffering, that prayer is going to be tested. If that's really where your heart is, it's going to be tested and tried. When slander comes, when mistreatment comes, will you and I be like Paul and Silas? Will we rejoice that we're worthy to suffer just like Christ did? Will we endure with a gentle spirit or will we strike back? I can't tell you how badly I wanted to strike back at this relative until the Lord reminded me. I'm here. That's just a part of walking with me. You need to just take a step back. You need to not mull over those thoughts. You need to not let them cause unrest and strife in your heart. So will you endure with a gentle spirit? Are you willing to pray for those who persecute you? You see, until the Lord comes back, all of us are going to experience some sort of excruciating stressors. We're going to have some sort of interpersonal woes or humiliating sicknesses or, or even hurts. We're all going to go through life. Things are going to stir up feelings. And we need to press into Christ, the joy of our salvation. Because the closer we press into Christ, the easier it is to rejoice. So the forbearing spirit is simply to allow the fruit of gentleness, the Holy Spirit fruit, to
to just warp its way through us and out to others. William Tyndale relates to this fruit, this gentleness, this forbearing spirit as softness. He says, be soft with men, just like you are soft with God. I mean, I'd never go and go, ah, 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 to God. And yet, I sometimes want to do that with men. Right? Yeah. Do others see you as reasonable? Are you able to hear what they say and consider what it is they have to say? I read an article the other day about um, people who will come into the church, they'll stay a while, and then after a while they just float away. And this, in this article gave some reasons, and one of the reasons was friendlessness. You see, they said, mm, the service was nice, the members were friendly, the sermon, it was okay. Um, but I didn't really make any friendships. You see, we've lost this ability to make friendships. We've lost this listening heart where a person shares what it is going on in their heart because we always want to top it with our own story or we want to fix their problem. But see, a gentle spirit doesn't top it with their own story and doesn't fix their problem. They listen and they invest in that friendship. So if we want to grow as a person and as a church, we must recapture the art of cultivating friendship and actively listening. Having that gentle spirit before God and before man. The Lord is near. Paul makes this command of rejoicing and gentleness in light of the nearness of Christ. He says Christ is coming again. But also, Christ is very near to those who worship him, who call upon him, and who love him. Philippians 6 and 7 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In the late 1980s, a singer uh, made this popular song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Okay? Now you're all thinking about that tune, aren't you? Don't worry, be happy. And our three-year-old grandson would use that when someone was sad, and he would say, don't worry, be happy. You know, but if someone is experiencing a tough time, we try and use that quick quip and say, oh, don't worry about it. You'll just be fine. You're just fine. So instead of, instead of really hearing their heart, that's not the intention of this. This says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul was not ignorant of the dangers. They were everywhere. The trials, the struggles, the challenges, the offenses, the rejections. All the happening for the sake of Christ. He was writing this from prison for promoting the gospel. So instead, he's reminding the church they are seated at a higher place. Regardless of the external pressures, few things were going well for Paul, and yet his encouragement was to not be anxious. Do you find this true of your own circumstances, that as soon as you start to encourage someone, you yourself feel encouraged? So as Paul is writing this encouragement to the church at Philippi, I'm sure that he was feeling encouraged as well. Don't worry points the picture, paints the picture that the Philippians were in a constant state of concern over life. They were focused on the what-ifs. It's really easy to get into that. They had plenty to worry about. Poverty, hunger, just being passed over for work because of their faith. But Paul says, train your anxiety for times of prayer and supplication. Jesus says in Matthew 6, do not be anxious for your life. There is something, this is something that the, the pagans specialize in. Rather, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything will be added to you. Don't worry, but pray. Jesus doesn't condemn the person stuck in worry. He acknowledges that worry exists, and he gives a way out. Same with Paul. Paul, like Jesus, addresses the problem head on. He says, pray and worship. 
just like when he and Paul, when he and Silas were thrown in prison and then worshiped and the prison bars came and broke away. The doors flung open. When we remind ourselves through prayer and worship of the sovereignty of God, our situation no longer seems all that dire. It's no longer our focus. We tell God what our problem is. We tell him what our needs are. That's just, supplication is just a fancy word for that. He's just saying, tell, tell me what you need. Tell me what's pressing on you. Tell me what's hurting your heart. That's supplication. Let the peace of God flow into your being. God's peace, unlike a man-made peace, unseats the demon of worry. It unseats the demon of anxiety. <clears throat> it's as if that thing can no longer hold your heart, your mind, your will, or your emotions. God's peace does not bow or bend to external pressures. They bend to him. So whatever is pressing on us, when we worship, when we pray, when we talk to God, when we commune with him, all those external pressures have to bow to the supreme and sovereign God, Jesus Christ. And God delivers the peace to the depth of our being that cannot be snatched away. So rather than entertain the thoughts that disturb you and cause concern, hang up, do not disturb sign over your heart, right? And then guard your heart. I'm just going to close with this. Guard your heart. Again, the filter. When we do the things that God asks us to do, we walk in the ways that Paul was reminding them to walk in. Our filter stays pure. That is what he wants for us. He doesn't want this for us. He doesn't want that gunked up, clogged filter where even the flow through it is disturbed. He wants a free flow of Holy Spirit through your life and into your being that you might impact those around you. Having the mind of Christ dwelling in the peace of God keeps the passions of your heart in check when you're out of control. Or when your expectations are not met. Feelings come and go. But Jesus bridges the gap and brings peace. A believer in Christ is able to walk in peace through every situation as we follow this. Verses 8 and 9 of Philippians 4. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Practice these things. Dwell on these things. Allow them to take residence in your life. It takes practice. But practice will become the strength of your inner man, and peace will flow. You will be strengthened, and God will flow purely as you submit to his will and his ways. Let's pray. Lord, we just say thank you. Thank you for your words, Lord. Thank you for understanding that sometimes we get in these situations and these places where there is some anxiety. But Lord, you have made a way. You have taken every anxious thought to that cross. And it has been crucified with Christ. And I am crucified. I have been crucified with Christ. You, Christ, live within. And so we just say thank you. Help us to walk in the peace of God. Help us to show our community, our families, those we love, our nation, what it is to walk in the peace of God despite any trial, despite any challenge. Help us, O oh Lord, strengthen us. 
Lord, we pray even for this parade tomorrow, we pray that the name of Jesus would be lifted high. We pray that you would draw people to yourself. And Lord, we pray that there would be a great harvest. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, and we bless your name. Amen. Let's worship with a closing song and then join us for fellowship.